Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Mooney. I'm the founding editor of NJ Spotlight. And thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've done a lot of roundtables in our 10 years of existence. I can't imagine one that's been more timely than this one, uh, dealing with uh, an issue that is on everyone's mind, literally uh, in the vaccinations of, of uh, New Jersey. Um, it is showing itself in, in maybe our record uh, number of folks who've signed up for this event. And I also want to thank uh, many of those folks who submitted questions in signing up. Um, those are really important in helping us inform this decision. We're not going to get to uh, many of them at all directly, but they certainly have helped uh, us shape this panel and, and what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so I want to really get through the logistics quickly. As, as mentioned, you submitted questions which were uh, greatly appreciated. We also invite conversation um, through uh, the chat function on this on the site. So feel free to join in that. And we also have placed a uh, question function where you can submit further questions, which we'll be monitoring and, and there's possibility that they will uh, get passed, passed up to the moderator as well. Uh, what's a social, what's a, uh, an event like this without a hashtag? And of course, um, it is vaccinating NJ is our hashtag and the handle of NJ Spotlight. Um, we will also be putting this uh, entire recording up uh, on our site in the coming days, and each of you who have registered will get an email that uh, provides a link to that. And so please, please share that with uh, friends and colleagues. And last but not least, I want to thank our sponsors. We could not uh, do this without the help of and support of our, our sponsors. And I want to uh, pass to Steve Shallot, our business development director, to say a few words about them before we start with the program. Steve? Thanks, John. I'm Steve Shallot. Business Development Director for NJ Spotlight News. It's my privilege to be the producer of today's event. As John mentioned, it wouldn't be possible to bring these events to the public free of charge without the gracious support of our sponsors, whom we would like to acknowledge with our thanks this afternoon. RWJ Barnabas Health is the largest, most comprehensive academic healthcare system in New Jersey, dedicated to providing high quality patient care, cutting edge research, and world class health and medical education to transform and advance healthcare in New Jersey. RWJPH covers nine counties with a service area of more than 5 million people and is one of the state's largest private employers. In addition to its clinical mission, RWJPH has long been committed to improving health outcomes, promoting health equity, eliminating healthcare disparities, and combating racism. Led by its social impact and community investment practice, during the COVID-19 pandemic, RWJBH has increased its efforts to address the growing number of vulnerable individuals plagued with food insecurity, housing uncertainty, job loss, increased medical concerns, and growing achievement gaps that, if left unaddressed, will have devastating effects on the communities the healthcare system serves. As the COVID pandemic advanced, RWJBH responded rapidly to meet the critical and emerging needs of patients working with partners to distribute food and PPE, while also organizing community COVID testing and reopening plans. Now that vaccines are available, RWJBH has been working with the state and numerous counties to launch vaccination clinics across New Jersey. Only through such collaboration can this pandemic finally be ended. So thank you to RWJ Barnabas Health. We'd like also to thank the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Since its inception almost 25 years ago, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey has been one of the major funders of health-related initiatives in our state, with grants totaling approximately $160 million. The foundation is dedicated to improving the health and wellness of vulnerable, underserved populations in Greater Newark and in the local Jewish community. They respond to the physical and behavioral health needs of people of all ages, races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, and gender identities seeding new initiatives, educating the public, and supporting projects that aim to improve physical and mental health. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Healthcare Foundation has awarded grants in excess of $6 million to help hospitals, health clinics, and community organizations protect themselves and their clients, address increased levels of stress and depression, and adjust their delivery of services to meet the dangerous and ever-changing realities on the ground. Vaccinations are key to the fight against this deadly virus. The Foundation is proud to support NJ Spotlight News in its efforts to educate policymakers, 
other funders, and the general public alike about all aspects of deploying and developing vaccines. The Foundation thanks everyone for participating today and asks that you take what is learned and turn that knowledge into action so that together we can defeat this virus and rebuild our communities and our families. So thank you to the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Lastly, we'd like to thank 1199 SEIU United Healthcare Workers East. Every day, the members of 1199 SEIU provide care and comfort to New Jersey's most vulnerable people. These are certified nursing aides, nurses, housekeepers, dietary and recreation aides, transporters, pharmacy workers, and other types of medical professionals, representing over 450,000 caregivers throughout New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Maryland, Florida, and Washington, D.C. 1199 SEIU is the largest and fastest growing healthcare union in the nation. Since the union's founding in 1932, its mission has been to stand up for quality health care, good jobs, and social justice for all. Over the years, 1199 SEIU has won some of the highest standards for health care workers anywhere in the country, including industry-leading wages and benefits, safe staffing ratios, secure retirement, model child care and education benefits, and a real voice on the job for workers. Today, 1199 SEIU's nursing home members are serving on the front lines of the COVID pandemic in New Jersey. Some have given their lives. They ask you to please stay safe, wear your mask, continue practicing social distancing, so together we can keep the virus out of our skilled nursing facilities and protect our most vulnerable. Thanks again to our sponsors. I'd like to turn it back over to John Mooney now to begin our program. Great, Steve. Uh, thank you very much. So let's get going. Um, it is with my great honor that I get to introduce our uh, opening remarks from uh, New Jersey's Health Commissioner, Judy Persicelli. Um, I'd love to be able to say this uh, woman who needs no introduction, uh, like Governor Murphy says every day uh, at his press briefings, but I'm gonna give her an introduction anyway, uh, briefly. Uh, she's been Health Commissioner since 2019, and before that was the president of University Hospital in Newark, as well as before that, St. Francis Medical Center in, um, in Trenton, uh, actually started her career as an ICU nurse. Um, so uh, certainly uh, strong training for what was to come, but certainly she stepped into a role that nobody could have envisioned. And we are really thrilled and, and lucky to have the commissioner with us, uh, taking some time out of what is a busy day, weeks, months, I'm sure. Uh, but take it away, commissioner, and thanks again for joining us. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. It has been just about a year that the department has been working to respond to COVID-19. We've learned a great deal over the past year and our understanding of the virus continues to evolve every day, such as the variants that we're dealing with now, seeing it in the United States in Britain in Brazil and in South Africa. Suffice it to say, we do learn something about this novel virus every single day. COVID-19 has confronted all of us with a challenge of a lifetime. It's ha it has impacted just about every way that we have, every aspect of our lives, every way that we work, how we interact with family and friends, how we go about everyday living, and how we go to school, uh, and how we travel. New Jersey had its first case of COVID-19 on March 4th, 2020. And it's an extraordinary scientific achievement that we sit here today and there are two vaccines that are available in the same year. It certainly has given us a lot of hope uh, for a future better than the present that we're living in right now. With every vaccination given, we come closer to the light at the end of the tunnel where we can move beyond this epidemic. We are on our way to a better future. The wide scale, vaccination campaign is a massive undertaking. Scarcity of vaccine right now has challenged all of our states, including New Jersey. With a new administration in place, we certainly are, are hopeful and we have already received some word that our vaccine supply will increase slightly and continue to increase over the next several months. Our strategic aims of our COVID-19 vaccine plan are to provide equitable access to all who live, work, and study in New Jersey. 
to achieve community protection. Uh, you may use the term herd community, assuming the vaccines effectiveness, availability, and of course, uptake, how many people line up to actually get a shot in the arm. And to build sustainable trust over time in the COVID-19 vaccine, and hopefully along the way in vaccines generally. Our overall goal of our vaccine plan is to vaccinate 70% of the eligible adult population in a six month period when vaccine becomes available widely available. That equates to between 70 and 80,000 vaccinations a day, or maybe about 4,500 to 5,500 vaccinations in every county a day. Vaccination started in our state in uh, December with what we call the phase 1A group, which includes healthcare personnel defined as paid and unpaid persons serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials. And it also included residents and staff at our long-term care facilities. The long-term care facilities in New Jersey have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are working step-by-step -step to serve all eligible populations Recognizing the high risk of our frontline healthcare uh, workers, uh, we started vaccinations in hospitals right before the holidays. We've used the CDC supported pharmacy retail partnership program for long term care residents and their employees. And we enrolled many of our congregate living facilities in that program as well. Non hospital based healthcare personnel are also currently considered in phase 1A. As we are still in the midst of the pandemic, it's important for our healthcare facilities to have the capacity to continue taking care of the patients that they expect to see. On January 7th, the department then began moving into phase 1B with sworn law enforcement and fire professionals eligible to be vaccinated. These are our frontline responders who through their jobs every day have a greater risk of coming in contact with infectious individuals and infectious materials. On January 14th, eligibility also expanded to New Jersey residents ages 65 and older and individuals between the ages of 16 and 64 with certain medical conditions. Expanding vaccine across uh, access to those 65 and older and those between 16 and 65 will help us protect our, again, our most vulnerable populations. At the present time in New Jersey, almost 50% of our mortalities are in individuals 80 years and older. Another 37%, 37 to 40% are in individuals the age 65 and older. So clearly almost 80% of our mortalities are in these age groups. It's important to understand as well that our two main goals of a vaccine program are first to prevent mortality and morbidity, and secondly, secondly, to focus on essential societal functions. More than 680,000 vaccine doses have been administered in our state so far. During 2021, additional people will become eligible to receive vaccination as the vaccine becomes available. Decisions about priority groups and how the doses will be spread across the state may change based on changes in vaccine supply and the public's demand. We presently have over 250 points of dispensing. You may hear the term pods, points of dispensing in the state. However, as, as the governor has stated frequently, we have the infrastructure, we're ready to go but we really don't have the vaccine supply. There are currently many more people seeking vaccinations uh, than there are appointments across the state. We continue to have a tremendous imbalance between demand and supply. More vaccine, however, will be arriving, we believe, in the coming weeks. Additionally, and hopefully, manufacturers like Johnson & Johnson will likely be approved or authorized, I should say, sorry, in the coming weeks, adding to 
the vaccine supply. We are continuing to expand our network of dispensing sites and have set up mega sites in every region in the state to accommodate very large numbers of individuals at one site, between 2,000 and 5,000 vaccinations a day. Given the operational and logistical considerations, in addition to storage requirements of vaccines, appointments are required for virtually all of our vaccination sites right now. Information on vaccination sites is available at covid19.nj.gov slash vaccine. To share information widely about vaccines and the rollout process, I continue to engage stakeholders weekly. I have talked to more than 6,500 stakeholders from about 90 groups, including aging and senior services, interfaith-based organizations, pharmacy associations, higher education, elected officials, disability adv advocates, unions, healthcare associations, counties and local health departments, law enforcement and first responders. We will continue this outreach to the Department of Health to build confidence in the vaccine, to share updates and gather important information from stakeholders regarding areas of need. Additionally, we have a group working specifically on vulnerable and specific populations with a lens on equity, making sure that those that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 have equitable access to the vaccine. Young Hispanic men are two and a half times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts in New Jersey. African-American males and females are two times as likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. Equitable distribution is a hallmark of the program that we are unfolding. With COVID-19 vaccine distribution underway, I am hopeful that a stronger, healthier future is in sight, but it's not over yet. We must continue to take steps to stop the spread of this virus. We need to safeguard. We need residents, all of us, to wear face masks, to physically distance, to stay home when you're sick and get tested. We need to continue to work together to protect our family, our friends, our neighbors, and our loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Percy Kelly. That was really, really helpful. I appreciate your time. And um, I, I just want to say, I was struck as I'm as I'm listening to this that, um, you know, as a reporter who covered, who's covered this story for practically a year, um, you know, it's our job to watch and critique and, um, you know, be the observers and be the ones that are holding, you know, government and these systems accountable. But I want to be clear that there's no question that the people in charge of this process have been working extraordinarily hard and that they care an awful lot about this. And I think that's clear in everything that you've done, um, you know, from showing up for all these briefings um, day in and day out. And, you know, we, we may quibble with the process or, you know, sometimes the answers, but um, but I think that we could, we, New Jer we're lucky to be in New Jersey. Let's just put it that way. We're very lucky to be in New Jersey. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. um, with it, without any further ado, I would like to introduce my excellent panel here, um, and these are going to be quick introductions because uh, they're well-known folks, and um, we want to get to the questions. Um, so we have Dr. Eddie Bresnitz, who was the former state epidemiologist, um, worked at Merck on vaccines, so is an expert on that uh, on that aspect, and is now advising DOH on their effort um, on their COVID effort. Uh, their COVID response. We have Ev Liebman, um, Advocacy Director for AARP New Jersey, who obviously represents uh, a great, huge group of stakeholders who have been, as the Commissioner said, um, particularly adversely affected by uh, COVID-19. We have Ms. Millie Silva, Executive Vice President of 1199 SEIU, as we heard, one of the largest healthcare uh, unions in the nation, um, and another uh, person who represents those who are on the front lines in a lot of different ways um, and have elevated risk uh, to coronavirus. And last but not least, we have uh, Barry Ostrowski, President and CEO of RWJ Barnabas Health. 
um, who has, a, you know, with 11 hospitals and a gazillion clinics, um, has had, uh, has seen the disease and then also been able to see how the, uh, the vaccine implementation has worked. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we got, we have had hundreds of really, really good questions. Um, a lot of them are very specific about whether people qualify or not. I encourage people to go on the state website or call the state hotline, um, because that, that they'll be able to answer those kind of questions. But the, the, they're the, there's a theme throughout many of these other questions. And I will try to, to get those addressed through the, the through what we, our discussions today. Um, Dr. Bresnitz, I'd like to start with you. Um, we had a fascinating discussion yesterday about vaccines in general. I, tell us, a, the public, a little bit about what they need to know about this vaccine in particular as a sort of a starting point. Safety, efficacy, you know, the unique challenges. What do we need to know about the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, well, first, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Uh, there are actually a, a bunch of vaccines that have been in development over the last years. And uh, we were fortunate that we, within a year of identifying the virus, there were two vaccines that were authorized by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, uh, for use in, in the adult, mainly in the adult population. Uh, they're both very similar vaccines. They're based on a new technology called messenger RNA technology. Um, there have never been vaccines that have been licensed um, using this technology previously. Uh, but nevertheless, um, these vaccines came through the clinical trials with flying colors, I might say, um, both from a safety perspective as well as a, an efficacy perspective. They're very similar. They have different characteristics in terms of storage. Uh, one of them requires ultra cold storage, the other one uh, frozen storage. So it makes it a little bit difficult to handle and it impacts on our, our allocation and distribution and, and use by the pods that uh, the commissioner mentioned. Um, but their efficacy in preventing COVID-19, um, confirmed COVID-19 disease is about 95% for both of them. And that's true even when you analyze subgroups by race and ethnicity, by underlying chronic conditions, and by age as well. Um, as far as the um, safety is concerned, uh, its tolerability profile or its reactogenicity is pretty much similar to other vaccines, maybe a little bit more. So individuals who are vaccinated can expect local injection site reactions, such as pain or swelling or some tenderness in their arm and also some generalized reactions such as fatigue or muscle aches or um, or, or generalized um, aches and pains, uh, fever potentially as well. It's a two-dose vaccine. Both of them are two-dose vaccines. Um, one, the Pfizer vaccine separated by 21 days and the uh, Moderna vaccine separated by 28 days. But again, they're very similar. And when asked uh, where, which vaccine a, you know, a person should take, I say, take your pick, just get vaccinated. Oh. That is a question that comes up, uh, comes up, you know, which one and can I mix and match? And my understanding is you, you should get the one that you start with, right? You, you don't make, you can't get a dose of one and then go to the other, right? You, you stick with what you got. That's correct. And when I said, do you pick your vaccine? Typically when you have an appointment to get vaccinated, they basically only offer you one of them. And yeah. you, when you return within the uh, set time period, you're going to get the other one as well. Now there are some guidance that says, if for whatever reason um, there's no record of what you took initially, you lost your record, and the site that you go to doesn't have that record, and the other vaccine's available, the recommendation is to get the other vaccine, but that really shouldn't happen uh, except in a, a rare instance. Okay. Okay. Um, this, we talk a lot about the scope of this you know, undertaking, right? I mean, nothing's ever been done like this. The, the governor, you know, has has mentioned the logistics. I mean, they're just astronomical. Um, Mr. Ostrowski, I'd like to ask you, from sort of the perspective of someone running a hospital system, is there any model in place for this kind of a public health campaign, either private or public sector, that you, that comes to your mind? Thank you, Lilo. Good afternoon, everyone. And I just want to emphasize before trying to answer your question, that which you said about being in the state of New Jersey. Judy and I are friends for a very long time, as is the governor and I, and I want to thank both of them for their leadership. The truth of the matter is we would be nowhere near where we are now in controlling this virus and improving the lives of our communities 
without their guidance and direction. And so I thank you for that. And to your second or your, your question, Lilo, we know of no model necessarily. Um, of course, thanks to uh, frontline healthcare workers, when a crisis exists, they rush in and they address it selflessly as they did when the virus began. Um, and thank God uh, we were able to do our best. Unfortunately, we lost far too many people, both by way of patients and healthcare workers. When the vaccine was ready to go, uh, I think all of us felt that there was a process and an infrastructure that we needed to activate in order to do it. Uh, I may be unique in this regard. I don't think any of us uh, fully appreciated what it would take to do this seamlessly and without any interruption. In fact, aspirations to do it like that, frankly, were unreasonable. Uh, I think under the circumstances, uh, all in, people have done well. Uh, we have 600,000 people waiting uh, for appointments, but in fact, tens of thousands of people have gotten uh, the vaccine and will continue to get it. Um, so uh, I think there was no model to which we could point and automatically implement. But I think uh, those of us on the provider side have done our best to mobilize all of our resources and assets, the most valuable of which are our folks, our people, our workers, our committed staff. Uh, and, and so just to reemphasize that, we have staff who get off from shifts and volunteer to be vaccinators. Uh, we have a volunteer crew uh, who are busy saving lives part of the day and vaccinating the rest of the day. So uh, I wish there had been a playbook for the virus. There really wasn't, and certainly not a playbook for vaccinations. But uh, again, perhaps it's just uh, my bias. I think all in, we're doing pretty well. Uh, getting folks vaccinated uh, through all of our sites. Yeah, that, that is good to hear. And um, I want to talk a little more about resources and, and we've had questions about, you know, how people can help. And there is, if people are looking to volunteer, um, they, the state is urging them to sign up through the, um, the Medical Reserve Corps, um, which is a county-based uh, they're, they're county based organizations. Um, there's information about that on the state website as well. So I encourage people to go there. Um, but before we continue, I want to um, share a piece from my colleague Brenda Flanagan, um, who's on the broadcast side of our, our NJT Spotlight News operation. Um, and she put together a short piece that talks a little bit about the state's work, but also gives us a sense of what uh, people on the ground implementing this process and experiencing it as consumers um, have to say about how it's working. So let's see that and then we'll come back and talk about the rest. An ER nurse at University Hospital got the very first dose of COVID vaccine given outside of a trial in New Jersey amid fanfare and applause. In mid-December, with vaccine supplies still ramping up and reportedly on course to meet demand, according to estimates at Operation Warp Speed in Washington, New Jersey health officials focused on other issues like setting up vaccination sites across the state and convincing vaccine-hesitant folks to get the shot, especially people of color who have died of COVID-19 at more than twice the rate of whites. I lost my mom to COVID in April. I lost my grandmother last night. I lost a lot of friends, so I'm one of those people that said, you know, if it's going to help, I don't mind. Polls in December showed only 60% of New Jersey residents would accept a safe and effective COVID vaccine. I absolutely think that vaccine hesitancy, human behavior, is going to be our Achilles heel in terms of curtailing this pandemic. And so New Jersey embarked on its ambitious goal to vaccinate 70% of its eligible population, 4.7 million people within six months. Hospitals and counties opened clinics. The state set up six mega sites, each able to give about 2,500 shots daily. Topping the list of those eligible, tier 1A, first responders and healthcare workers. At University Hospital, January 4th. We've given over 3,000 doses already. Uh, to individuals here, frontline healthcare workers uh, and folks who support them who are in contact with patients. 
Uh, and so the vaccination efforts going extremely well. Meanwhile, under a federal partnership, pharmacy giants CVS and Walgreens would vaccinate another 1A group, staff and vulnerable residents at New Jersey long-term care facilities, where the virus has slaughtered more than 7,000 since spring. It started auspiciously with a 103-year-old nursing home resident getting the first shot in late December. Good job. Yeah. But the pace of vaccinations at long-term care facilities is lagged with hundreds of thousands thousands still not immunized. Both Governor Murphy and residents' families demanded action. So many people don't even have an idea yet when their loved ones are going to be vaccinated. They're punching under their weight, particularly Walgreens, uh, and that's where most of the the, the yet-to-be-used doses are. Both pharmacies claim to be doing their best amid a lot of federal rules and protocols, but even early on, experts already saw other challenges. There are many organizations trying to be on the 1B list, um, which will be an interesting set of conflicts. Uh, so who are the essential people who should be second in line for the vaccine? Good question, especially after the CDC recommended expanding eligibility to include all those over 65 and people aged 16 to 64 with certain medical conditions. Jersey opened up eligibility and demand for vaccinations exploded, just as Operation Warp Speed admitted it had depleted the federal vaccine stockpile. Vaccine supplies plateaued. People got panicky. I'm living in a community where the average age is 78 years old and the anxiety levels are off the charts. Seniors without digital savvy despaired over navigating New Jersey's online vaccination registry and calls swamped a new state COVID hotline. One hospital canceled its first dose appointments. Thousands of people tried and failed to get the few available slots through their provider or local county websites. You have to reload, reload, refresh, refresh. I think I probably hit the refresh button about eight million times. She didn't get an appointment, but a new J&J &J single dose vaccine due to come up for federal emergency use authorization next week holds great promise. And President Biden's plan expects to deliver 100 million shots in 100 days. We are so under vaccinated at this point. And so having more of those pairs of doses really allows people to I think have a little bit of hope and move past some of the frustration they've been feeling. But for now, New Jersey cannot meet the demand for COVID vaccinations. I'm starting to have my doubts for the first time that we'll be able to reach herd immunity by June. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Yes, a lot in that to unpack there. Um, and again, I think you, you can raise questions about how it's done, but um, there is there is this overwhelming question of how many doses we have, right? If we don't have enough, we don't, not everybody can get in. Um, and the commissioner has made a point of saying repeatedly, everybody will get vaccinated. It's just a question of when. Um, I'd like to start with sort of this question of who is in the priority group. Um, Ms. Silva, can we... Tell, tell us a little bit about what you make of that, of, of some of the states, how the state approached this and what it means for your folks. And I'm thinking, you know, what it means for those who aren't in the group, like teachers. Teachers come up a lot. When are teachers going to be eligible? Tell us your thoughts on this. So Lilo, so glad to be with you and to everyone um, on this panel tonight. I think this is such a critical conversation that we're having in this moment. Um, and so I think to your question, you know, I, one of the things that we have been very clear about is that healthcare workers who have been at the front lines, who have been the ones who have been coming the closest in terms of potential contact with the virus because of the very nature of the work that they do, having them front and center as part of the 1A group um, that has access and is essentially how we talk about it in the union is that you're now at the front of the line in terms of being able to access the vaccine I think was a critical and smart decision by the commissioner and by our state administration. Because one of the things we have to make sure that we do is to make sure that all of our healthcare workers are vaccinated so that they have that additional protection as they're going to continue to see us through the days and weeks and months ahead um, to get this virus under control. No question. There's also the sort of question of sort of who are the essential workers? 
uh, in New Jersey? And, you know, what do we do to make sure that teachers, uh, as well as the people who bring food to the grocery store for us, or the people who are working at the warehouses and are making sure that our Amazon shipments get delivered on time, uh, you know, which we've come to rely on them so very much, I think that is sort of thinking about how do we make sure that there is a lens of equity, which I heard the commissioner speak to, which is powerful because when you look at the demographics of who healthcare workers are, who are who the essential workers are, including our teachers, including grocery uh, workers and retail workers, it is also people of color. Um, and so it is the people who are both the workers um, and the ones who are driving the economic engine of New Jersey, as well as the ones who are disproportionately negatively impacted um, by the disease of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like this has been, um, this pandemic has been an education for some of us. And, you know, it's, yes, we're catching up to what a lot of people knew for a long time, but how, what percentage of that um, frontline or, you know, quote, essential workforce it, are people of color? Um, what the sort of compounding impacts of their, you know, social and economic situ situation means for health? Um, you know, I mean, it, it just seems like it's, it's, um, it is almost overwhelming um, how magnified it becomes. Um, and I want to talk more about equity, but before I'm going to ask Dr. Bresnitz about it in a second. But before we do that, um, Ms. Liebman, I'd like to ask you about we, you know, the uh, federal partnership and the rollout in nursing homes has has been criticized, uh, but in some ways it's working, right? I mean, tell us a little bit about what you're hearing on that part. Sure. Thank you, Leela, um, and thank you for inviting AARP to this NJ Spotlight News Forum. It's an honor to be here with my fellow panelists, um, and I also really want to echo your remarks earlier about the work of Commissioner Persa Kelly and her team um, and the entire state of New Jersey, who we know uh, are working around the clock um, in very uh, difficult circumstances. Um, so thank you, Commissioner, for all of the work that you're doing. Um, you know, AARP has been uh, fighting uh, for the well-being of older Americans for more than 60 years, and no more so now uh, in the face of this devastating pandemic. Um, we certainly support uh, the prioritization of nursing home residents and staff and older residents in general, as we heard from the commissioner, uh, the older one is, uh, the higher the risk is for mortality and uh, more serious consequences of the disease. Um, we have heard the reports. We have heard from our members that yes, perhaps the program in our nursing homes through CVS and Walgreens has been a little slower uh, than we might have liked, but overall at this point we are hearing uh, that it is working, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the sites um, are being scheduled, the vaccines are being provided. We're confident uh, that the government at the federal and state level have both the initial shots and the second shots uh, for these residents and staff. Um, and so hope to see uh, that program um, completed, not just in our nursing facilities, but uh, other congregate facilities as well who can participate in the, in the program. Um, I would say for the older residents of New Jersey who are not in those programs, uh, the experience, uh, as we saw on the video, uh, hasn't been going as well. Um, there's a lot of frustration out there, um, people spending uh, hours and days uh, on websites, um, and we are hearing that frustration loud and clear. Um, the governor has talked about how we're building the ship as we're sailing it. Um, and uh, I think that building continues. Um, but as we've heard from our panelists, um, what is vitally important now is that we ramp up production of the vaccine so we can get more vaccine into the state, into the arms of the hundreds of thousands of people who want that vaccine. 
Right. Yeah, it again, comes back to supply. We do, um, you know, the, the overwhelming number of questions we got were, uh, you know, have been about scheduling, right? When can I get it? What, um, how can I get an appointment? Um, I think the when can I get it, uh, I, I think perhaps, well, I'm, I'm going to come to ask Dr. Bresnitz to back this, but I, I'm curious about the timeline, right? Because there's been a lot of confusion over what the in six months means and how quickly we really expect to get to some level of herd immunity or community protection. And also, does that mean that for some people they will be waiting months, right? I mean, not everybody can get the shot at once. Can, can Dr. Bresnes, can you sort of address that, that expectation and that timeline a little bit? Yeah, well, the first thing uh, to say is that we're talking about supply versus demand. And to start off with supply, the supply is limited. There is, um, at least from a New Jersey perspective, we were getting a little bit over 100,000 doses a week. Um, I think the commissioner mentioned that we're now going up to 130,000 a week, and that includes the doses for both the first and the second dose. Um, we currently have uh, registered in our state site um, uh, over 2 million people. Um, and if you look at those who are eligible currently, um, based on um, what the commissioner uh, mentioned um, a few minutes ago, we have over a 4 million people right now who are eligible by those criteria. So clearly the supply cannot meet the demand. Um, the commissioner mentioned that uh, I believe there was an estimate of about 80,000 a day. Um, uh, to achieve that aspirational goal of about 70% in six months. We're doing about 22, 23, 24,000 a day right now, not because we could do more. We are definitely set up. We have enough pods to, to handle much more vaccine. It's really um, related to the limited supply coming out of the manufacturers. And, you know, having been in industry, I can assure you that the manufacturers would love to basically make more vaccine, but making a vaccine is a complicated process. Um, we talk about the, um, the process being the product when you talk about vaccines but it's a, because it's a biological product. And so there are many, many uh, steps that go into making it and many quality control um, aspects as well. So I can't give you an exact timeline of when it will be. We, we clearly are expecting to see more vaccine coming out from the current manufacturers that are authorized, the Pfizer and Moderna. And certainly if J&J &J and, and, and other manufacturers get authorized to put their vaccines out there in people's arms, that will basically increase the supply and allow us to accelerate the number of people who get vaccinated on a daily basis. But it's going to take time. Um, I also, the, the issue of herd immunity, I don't, I don't particularly like that term. I really like the term community protection. Uh, herd immunity, to me, it's, it really came out of, you know, vaccinating cows, which I, I, I find it just a little bit... Uh, um, disrespectful in a way. Um, but community protection, um, you really need to have about supposedly 70 to 80 percent with this vaccine. We don't really know with this particular virus um, what herd immunity is needed to protect the population. But I also want to point out there's a lot of people who've actually had natural disease. And so they have some underlying immunity to infection as well. So it's going to be a combination of how many people get vaccinated and actually how many people have been infected. And you know, we've had a lot of people in the state who've had infection that have been diagnosed and many more that have been asymptomatic and undiagnosed but had disease nevertheless. And just before I leave that point, though, um, my understanding is it, if you have been infected with COVID, it is recommended that you are vaccinated because we don't know how long that immunity, I mean, I'm sorry, if, you, if, if you've had COVID in the past, right, you're, you are supposed to be vaccinated at some point because we don't, you're not guaranteed immunity through the infection itself. Is that correct? Well, Maybe not correct. as a priority. Uh, well, we're not we're not prioritizing or deprioritizing people who've had previous infections. Um, they will have some underlying protection. We don't know how long it, it lasts. Uh, the level of antibodies that they get or in, in, uh, immune response that they have is not as good as when you get vaccinated. They've been able to show that through 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 studies. And so the recommendation is that they should get vaccinated. They, they don't necessarily get to the back of the line, uh, but there is a recommendation out of the CDC, and, and we support that, that those individuals could consider waiting um, 90 days from the time that they first had symptoms to the time they get vaccinated. But it's really a discussion they should have with their healthcare provider. Okay. 
And should, I mean, what's your, what's your sense of, of this frustration over the sign up process? Um, I mean, and, and is, is there, is there a way that we can make this easier for people? How, how do you, what do you urge people to do with their, when they're frustrated and they can't find an appointment? What should we tell them? Be patient. I know it's hard to be patient um, under the circumstances. People have been under a lot of stress over the last year, worried about getting disease, seeing loved ones and, and others getting sick and, and potentially dying. Um, you know, it's difficult to socially distance and wear a mask all the time and, and being cautious all the time, being on, on sort of razor's edge. And so when there's this vaccine that's available, amazingly, within less than a year, they're now, everybody's desperate to get that. And so they're, you know, people are impatient, but it's not surprising that they're impatient. And so all that we can see is be, be patient. I've told uh, friends and family who've been trying to get vaccinated that they, they need to look at this as a project, actually. Um, uh, Eve mentioned that, uh, or, um, that, you know, their people are basically, um, or it was actually on the segment where someone is, she said she was uh, pressing the refresh button a million times, a little bit of hyperbole there, but I'm sure many times. Um, and and I, what I've heard from people is they keep doing it, um, going to different sites, the vaccination sites, that eventually they basically can get an appointment. As time goes on and there's more vaccine available, more appointments available, more support from the state through our call center um, and through other uh, mechanisms, people will be able to get vaccinated, but they just have to be patient and continue to do the, um, you know, all the social distancing measures and the non-pharmaceutical invention, interventions like masks and so on. They're going to have to continue to do that after they get vaccinated too. Um, the vaccines are not 100% efficacious. We don't know yet whether it prevents transmission of disease. And so they're going to have to keep wearing, doing all those things until the public health folks tell them to stop doing that. And that's not going to be for some time. Okay. Thank you. I know that answered a number of people's questions. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, you know, maybe it's about reframing expectations here a little bit, right? We're talking about months. This is not, a, this is not weeks, you know, it's not, will, will you get in to, tomorrow or Thursday or next Thursday? It's, you know, let's, let's look at this as a, a, a slower process. Um, Mr. Ostrowski, I'd like to ask you about, we talked a lot about equity. Um, how do you build, how do you try to, to ensure that you are, how, you're, you're, you're distributing it equitably, the vaccine equitably within your system? Or, you know, how do you try to, to, to elevate the needs of those who tend to be up, up, underrepresented? Well, I, I, I think this is a very big issue. You know, we have a series of anomalies in this distribution and vaccination program. One, uh, the commissioner mentioned uptake. We still have many healthcare workers who have not availed themselves of the opportunity to get vaccinated, although they were invited first and frankly had the most convenient opportunity to get it. And as we all know, many of those healthcare workers are disproportionately people of color and come from vulnerable communities. And so I think it's very important that we launch, as the state has done and many of the systems in New Jersey, certainly ours included, strong advocacy pieces, not generalized advocacy pieces, but advocacy pieces that directly address the reservations that we know certain constituencies have. If you're a person of color, particularly black, your skepticism about the healthcare delivery system, uh, system is correct. You have every right to be skeptical there were everything from experimentation to the same disproportionate outcomes that we talk about but haven't yet fixed. So you are rightful in your concern about taking the vaccine. We have to address that. We can't simply uh, try to say, forget that and get the vaccine. Likewise, if you're a woman of a childbearing age, you have other concerns. And so there has to be targeted advocacy to ensure that your concerns are uh, getting the response that is necessary. So I think, number one, we have to advocate to take the vaccine, which will have special attention to those in vulnerable communities. Now, we are, and we love being in vulnerable commu communities as a general health care delivery system. And I will say, in the counties in which we're most active, Middlesex and Essex, there is availability that is uh, easier access in terms of getting to a site so that you can get the vaccine. And every healthcare organization needs to, in fact, support 
not only the advocacy, but the transportation and whether it's watching loved ones while others get uh, the vaccine, there has to be a program to in fact make it seamless and available to those in, in our vulnerable communities. That's equity. You can't treat everybody equally because that's not equity. And so investing in the special needs of people who need to be able to get to the vaccine is something we're focusing on. The, of course, the frustration is you can activate all that and not have this enough supply to vaccinate the people you're now getting excited about getting the vaccine. So balancing these emotions and the practicalities and the logistics uh, tend to be a challenge. But if we're not guided by equity and if we're not paying attention to vulnerable communities, we are not doing the right things. As far as I'm concerned, that's a simple fact. Yeah, speaking, and, and I know that that's been something that's been a priority for, for your organization for a while. Um, speaking of vulnerable people, um, Ev, Ev, Ms. Liebman and I had a great conversation yesterday, and we started talking a little bit about um, the people that we haven't sort of been talking about so far, right? And, and we got a number of questions about this as well. Um, one woman whose husband has a tracheotomy, um, I think, or a tracheostomy, I think it's called. Um, a, a woman who had a, has a severely autistic son who's terrified of going to a medical facility. Um, Ev, tell us a little bit about, you know, homebound folks. Um, what are the challenges there and what can we do? Sure, thank you, Lilo. Um, I think that this is uh, an area or a part of the ship uh, that we're still building um, and that it needs to be built. Um, we have to incorporate into our plan uh, more opportunities for people to access vaccines who cannot go to vaccine sites themselves. Uh, we have a number of uh, frail uh, homebound elderly um, who uh, aren't able to travel. Um, we need to put systems in place so that we uh, can bring vaccines to the home where necessary. I know that that is something that the department is working on. Um, we're glad that the call center is up and running. Um, we know that it had, as you said, been inundated. Uh, there's quite a demand. Uh, to be able to talk to somebody on the phone. Many older residents, but also in many communities of color, uh, there is not access to the internet. Many older folks are not comfortable using the internet um, and need to be able to talk to a person on the phone. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to the call center, uh, not just being able to provide information, um, but also to get to the point where it can actually assist people in making appointments. Um, and then there's the question of transportation. Um, we have many folks who um, just don't have access to transportation, uh, are dependent on senior transportation services or other types of transportation or don't have a car, uh, particularly in rural parts of the state. And so the need to put in place transportation services to support um, those members of our community is vitally important as well. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to add uh, a little bit more on our nursing homes. Um, while we're um, encouraged to see the program uh, in our long-term care facilities, um, we're, we're hoping that as that program is successful, we'll be able to open the doors of those facilities a little bit more to visitation, uh, where so many of our residents are being impact, uh, impacted by uh, the social isolation um, and some of the devastating um, health impacts of that alone. So another area where we hope to see some progress on. Thanks, yeah, Lisa. I worry. Thank you. I worry about the long term impacts of this pandemic. I mean, on elderly, on children, on every, you know, on our frontline healthcare workers who are, you know, suffering PTSD. I mean, this is, it's going to have 
it's this is the real issue. Um, Dr. Bresnitz is going to have to leave us in a few minutes, so I want to grab you before you have to go. Um, anything you want to say um, about the the? Uh, I'll be honest, the registration system is is uh, causing a lot of grief um, to members of the public. A lot of the emails have been about that. Um, or the phone uh, phone system, or, or registering in general. I, I believe the commissioner tells people to sign up on every site they can. Um, that that may sound counterintuitive, but will you talk a little bit about that? And then I, I want to ask you a couple quick sort of medical questions about the vaccine. Well, I want to point out that the um, online registration system that we have now that has now over two, two million registrants in the space of about three weeks did not exist at all, um, you know, a month or two ago. It was built from scratch. Um, it's, it started off slowly, um, but it will have a lot of functionality as we move along and we fix the bugs in the system. But as I said, with all those two million and plus people registered, it shows that it can, it can work. Um, with the call center now is, which just started this week, um, um, has already been inundated with calls. Um, the call center folks, the agents, will be able to help people identify whether they're eligible, um, help them pre-register as well, and potentially help them find places where they can vaccinate it and even assist once we get enough vaccine. It all comes down to having enough vaccine. And then, of course, we do, as you pointed out, have a lot of other uh, pods that may have their own registration systems. And so that's a little bit of a challenge to people because they may have to register on, on multiple sites. And, and there are a variety of reasons for that. Some of them are, are, are good and reasonable. Why that's the case, that there are, you know, they're not all in the central system, um, but that's the way it is. You know, there are other states that don't have a central registration system at all. For example, our neighbor next door in Pennsylvania. Um, nor do they have a call center. So we're way ahead of the game from that perspective. And, and we're still very early in the distribution of the vaccine. We've only had it since the middle of December, and we're now towards the end of February. So we're talking about uh, January, rather. So we're only talking about six weeks. And this campaign is going to go on for many, many months. And I can assure you that within a few weeks, we should have many of the bugs worked out in those two systems and additional functionalities um, installed in, 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 into those systems as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I'm always struck by, by, you know, the complaints. Why isn't there a centralized this or that? Um, and, and I can understand the concern, but on the other hand, you know, we, this is the system we have in the United States of America, right? It's a private sector system, multi-stakeholder process. We don't have one big giant database where everybody's DNA exists and everybody's medical record and you can like it or not like it, but it, you know, it impacts when we have to do something like this, right? Um, I mean, it, England's in a very different situation right now because they can do it all themselves. We don't have that here in the United States. Um, but Dr. Bresnick, you can share your thoughts on that. But what I really want well, yeah, to, I know another, you know, when we talk about the healthcare system, I know people say, well, it's not really one system. It's multiple systems. If you just look at insurance coverage, um, most people don't even understand, you know, insurance coverage or how they're covered as well. So it's, it's quite a complicated. But public health is also complicated the way it's organized. Every state is different. Uh, public health also has many pieces to it, um, both in the private and the public sector. I mean, all these sites that are giving out vaccines, hospitals, fairly qualified health centers, pharmacies, um, they're not necessarily considered public health agencies, but, but they are public health agencies. They're part of the system. They're part of the public health system. And so it's not surprising that it's complicated. You know, the, the good news is that we have a lot of people who can provide vaccines and will be authorized to provide vaccines. We've expanded the number of people, professionals, who can actually be vaccinated, who previously didn't have that within their scope of uh, professional responsibility. So there's a lot we've done and are doing to expand the, the capacity of the system. It's just going to take a little bit of time. And again, I'm gonna come back to the, the, you know, the words of advice is to be patient. Okay, if you don't mind, before you go, um, what should people do about second dose registration? Um, does the vaccine work against the new variants? And will we likely need booster shots um, annually or every few years? Three quick questions, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, all in 30 seconds, right? Um, so the first question was about the, um, the second dose. 
Uh, number one, um, every single pod um, should be making, helping the person make an appointment for that second dose before they even leave the facility um, uh, when they get their first dose. Um, I, I know that the, um, the call center will be helping people who, for whatever reason, didn't get an appointment for the second dose to get their second dose, to make arrangements to do that. Um, they can also call the place where they were vaccinated initially and uh, make arrangements through that call center to the best of their ability to get that second dose. So we're, it's important that they get that second dose. They will not have maximal efficacy unless they complete the series. And we know some people aren't coming back because they might have had a significant reaction um, with the first dose and they're concerned about having another reaction when they come back, and they might. Uh, but they need that second dose to, to get the maximal efficacy and to ensure that there's durability of the vaccine. Um, the second question you asked was about variants. That's true. The, there are new new um, variants of the um, of the of the virus, of the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, we're finding out and learning about those as as each day goes by. The commissioner, introductory remarks, mentioned that every day we learn something new, and that's that's true. Um, the the most common variant now is the one that uh, originated in the United Kingdom. Um, right now, it, it appears that it's um, it increases transmissibility of infection. Um, but it doesn't necessarily, we're, we're not really sure yet whether it causes more severe infection um, or, or increased mortality. Uh, the other variants are, um, there has been um, one identified from Brazil and, um, and another one from South Africa and then a third one in California. Um, a couple, there have been a couple of instances of those in the U.S. and we're still learning about those. It just hasn't been enough time to do that. And your third question was... My third question was booster shots. Will we need an annual, like a flu shot? Well, we don't know. It's a great question. Um, you know, as it relates to variants, and we know that Moderna is already in the process of developing um, uh, another vaccine that might address this issue um, of the variant in case that um, it, the variant is resistant to the current vaccines. Um, we don't know whether that's going to be the case. And we really don't know whether a two-dose series is going to require a booster in a year or an annual basis like the influenza vaccine. I mean, there's just too much unknown about the coronavirus at this point in time. So we'll have to see. Let's hope that we don't need a booster shot, um, but we might. But right now, our task is to get everybody vaccinated with uh, the current vaccines that we have and really worry about the booster shot um, sometime in the future, at least the, uh, the third booster shot, because we refer to the second dose as a booster dose as well. So I don't want people to be confused about that. Right, right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Appreciate yeah. your time. Really appreciate it. Um, Thank you very much. I'm sorry I have to leave early. All right. No, I think our the, I think our other panelists can stick around for a few more minutes. Um, and if so, um, Ms. Silva, I'd like to ask you a little bit about what what does it mean for the folks you represent? Um, where do you see this in, say, a year? What's sort of like the post-vaccine world for frontline workers? And I'm, I'm, I'm so struck by how we talk about essential workers in, with this reverence in a way, you know, we've never had so much respect for the people that perhaps, you know, bring us our groceries or, you know, do these, do these tasks that we sort of took for granted. It's, it, I'd like to think some of that sticks around post pandemic, but um, where do you see, what does it mean for these folks? So um, there's no returning back to the old normal. I think that we are uh, as a community, as a society going to have to reimagine what our, uh, what our work looks like what it looks like for us to address issues regarding healthcare disparities in terms of access to healthcare, as well as how people are treated, how we think about the work that people do and the value that we ascribe to it, and what it means in terms of the different choices that we have to make, how we prioritize healthcare, essential work, uh, both investing in that workforce that provides it, and for all of us who are consumers of healthcare, uh, and also the services that are so critical to our day-to-day -day survival, the people who bring us our groceries every day. What does it mean in terms of our being able to honor that work, uh, not just in words, but also in deeds and in policy changes? I just had a few questions left, but one of them that has come up a couple times is, should we be mandating for this for anybody? Um, Mr. Ostrowski, I'd like to, to start with you. I mean, from your point of view, 
I, what this question has come up a lot from nurses, right? Um, you know, or, or other people who are providers who are either concerned or wondering, you know, what their employer is going to do. How do you approach that question? Well, I think it's a major policy decision generally to be frankly reviewed on a policy macro basis. In our organization, the flu shot is mandatory. Uh, I think if the current vaccine wasn't under an emergency use authorization, which technically means it's still experimental to some degree, uh, we would have far less reservation about insisting that it be mandatory. I am sure that within a year or two, it will be mandatory or sooner. Um, I am the one who would believe in making it mandatory because it's not only safe for the person receiving the vaccine, but I think that individual has a responsibility to his or her colleagues to ensure maximum safety. So we have not made it mandatory yet, but I think from a regulatory standpoint, it probably is less, uh, less opportunistic for that, but I do think soon it will be. And, but that designation between emergency use and full approval is, is probably a legal issue that would come into play, it sounds like. Yeah, I think so. And of course, the priority right now is to get everybody vaccinated. Of uh, and and I, I think there's plenty, as been said throughout the hour, there's plenty of demand uh, with insufficient supply for the moment. Now, that'll get better. Yep. Uh, and so I'm not sure mandatory is the requirement to continue a robust vaccination program. Mm -hmm. Ms. Liebman, I'm wondering about mandates or another thing that came up was vaccine passports. Um, is that something that you see in the future? I mean, I'm wondering, you know, I'm thinking about older people in nursing homes and how, you know, it might be easy if everybody had some kind of stamp of, of safe approval. But um, would that work or, or is that something anybody's discussing? Um, well, our view at AARP, Lilo, is that all consumers need to remember that all medical treatment, including vaccines, have benefits and risks, and that people need to be able to determine what is best for them. Um, we are uh, using the full force of our organization to ensure that people have access uh, to the information they need, uh, including uh, from their own medical providers to make the decision that's best for them. Uh, the more transparent that we can be, um, uh, and for government and drug makers, for example, to be fully transparent about vaccine safety records and effectiveness, including information about how many people, for example, of different racial and ethnic backgrounds participated in clinical trials, is something uh, is is important information for people to be able to have so that they can make their best decisions for themselves and their family. Right, right. Do, um, I, I'd like to, I think we should probably wind up. Um, I'd like to close with a, just to have each three of you give me a thought on what was, if, if, if you could change one thing, we'll say the state or federal level, um, if you had your magic wand, what would it be? What 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 would be the one thing you would change? I'm going to go my right to left, so that means I'm going to start with Millie, Ms. Silva. Magic wand goes to you first. Making sure that uh, healthcare workers continue to have access to the full gamut of the tools that they need in order to be able to protect themselves and their family, right? So that as we think about this particular pandemic and anticipate that there may be others in the future, how is it that we can build out systems and bureaucracies that are prepared to uh, meet the needs of caregivers as well as the people, their patients and their residents? So that this isn't a one-time fix, so that we can use this, we can leverage this into the future. I think that's the what we need to learn from the experiences of others. Yes. Ms. Jostra. Well, I would borrow the same magic wand and hope for the same thing, but I, I would emphasize uh, your previous question. The new reverence, as you put it, for frontline workers and essential workers has to translate into social programs. 
yes, we need to correct the, the disparities in health care, but if we don't take this opportunity to address substandard housing and food insecurity and all of those social determinants that we now know uh, beyond uh, any refutation, make people sick and stop them from having good lives, we must address that. Now's the time. So we'll get vaccinated for sure, but if it stops there, we will have missed a golden opportunity to really improve the people's lives in our communities. It's interesting. I talked to some folks at the months ago, you know, almost a year ago, about how do you make these types of changes in an emergency? And they say, if you can't start making these types of changes now, you know, they'll almost never happen. So you have to kind of use this, the, 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 the situation we've been given to, to, to implement change, to force change, really. We're down to two of our four panelists. So, um, <laughs> you know, before I lose any more, um, let me thank everybody very much for, for joining us today. Um, I know there were a lot more questions than we were able to answer. Um, I encourage you to look on the state website uh, and, and call the hotline. And as they said, be patient. But um, thank you all very much for being with us. And thanks to my panelists for an excellent conversation, um, especially the two of still with me, Mr. Ostrowski yeah. and Thank you. Silva. Thank you. Thank you. Take, <laughs> Take care. Thank get, you. The, uh, get the award for lasting the longest. Thank yeah, you. There you go. Be well. Thank you. Well, that was great. Uh, thank you very much, Lilo. Uh, a wonderful session. And, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, obviously a important and provocative discussion and one I, I, I envision that we'll probably keep going. Uh, certainly this pandemic is not over. So I want to thank uh, certainly the panelists and, and, and our audience for staying with us. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned early, we will be putting this entire event online, a tape of it online. Uh, each of you who registered will get an email with the link. And we encourage and welcome you sharing it with uh, friends and colleagues as well. Um, and also stay tuned. We'll be doing more roundtables both on COVID and other issues in, in the coming months. So uh, keep an eye out for that. But again, I want to thank everybody and uh, wish you all, um, you know, further endurance through this and stay well and stay safe. Thanks again. <laughs>